Hello and welcome to the Australia Taxation Advanced Webinar for Week 4. Today we are going to deal with Module 4, which is all about companies and company distributions. Um, uh, company structure is commonly used um, in businesses within Australia, so it's really important to understand the um, specific tax implications that can apply when you operate through a company structure and also where you distribute amounts out to a company shareholders. Um, in terms of where we are within the webinar schedule, we are in week four dealing with module four, quite a big module, we're 13%, so one of the biggest that you'll have to deal with. Um, so really important to understand this content. It will also come in really um, handy when we are dealing with uh, our business structure module, um, which comes in a couple of weeks. Um, hopefully you've had the chance to do your preparation for week four. So you've watched all our short videos, you've read the module, and you've also attempted the module four practice quiz and the pre-webinar activity, which we'll discuss later. So in terms of our learning objectives, we've got five learning objectives for this module. First of all, determine the taxable income and tax payable by a resident company. There's quite a lot of assumed knowledge in this learning objective, so the module doesn't go through this in a lot of detail, but it does summarise the process that we use and also look at the relevant corporate tax rates that we must apply. The second learning objective there, apply CGT concessions, rollovers and reliefs to companies. The main CGT concessions that we're dealing with here are the very important small business CGT concessions, which can make a big difference to capital gains or losses arising at both the company and the shareholder level. But we also have various rollovers that we'll mention briefly um, if you decide to um, rearrange your corporate structure. Um, they can avoid any CGT um, liability arising. Rising. Uh, learning objective three, apply the rules of the imputation regime to maintain a franking account. So a franking account is the means by which company tax paid by the company itself can be imputed to the individual shareholders and used as a credit to um, reduce the amount of tax they pay on company distributions. So really important rules regarding um, the operation of a franking account. You really need to understand those to, re to understand the way that companies can distribute their profits out to the individual shareholders. Learning objective uh, four is examine the tax implications for shareholders receiving distributions. So we've spoken about the franking account and the way that these franking credits for the tax paid by the company can dis be distributed for the benefit of the shareholders. Well, those shareholders, as well as getting this franking credit tax offset, they also have to gross up um, their income on uh, income received. Um, by the franking credit attached to that distribution. So we'll go over that in a little bit of detail later on. And the last learning objective there is all about deemed dividends. Now, these are really important from a private company perspective, uh, particularly when you've got certain loans, um, payments, or debt forgiveness between a private company and their shareholders. They can be treated as deemed dividends under Division 7A of the 1936 Act. And um, there's also other ways in which uh, deemed dividends can arise, such as on uh, off-market share buyback and also on winding up when the liquidator makes certain distributions. So we'll discuss those at the end of this webinar. So here's our overview of module four. As I say, it's one of the biggest modules um, in this course. We're 13 percent. So that's roughly eight marks in your exam. So really important to understand the content of this module. So let's have a look at this first learning objective, determining the taxable income and tax payable by a resident company in a complex situation. So you'll remember that um, companies are separate legal entities from their shareholders and members, and they are required to both lodge a, a company tax return and pay tax on their taxable income. So that's different from the situation of, say, a trust that has to lodge its own tax return, but isn't itself liable um, for tax on its taxable income. <clears throat> 
Distributions from profits uh, taxed in the company are also taxed to shareholders, but we've got this offset that we've already mentioned. So the purpose of the franking account within the company is to keep track of the amount of tax the company has paid so that tax can then be used um, to frank the dividends and the shareholders receive this franking credit tax offset. Um, the purpose of that is to ensure that those profits are not taxed twice, once at the company level and then again in the hands of the shareholders. And an important distinction when we're looking at the taxation of companies is between a public and a private company. Now, there are corporations law definitions of private and public company, but they differ a little bit from the tax law definitions um, of a public or private company. Um, so be aware that if you're a private company for, for corporations law purposes, you might be um, a public company for tax law purposes and vice versa. So just be aware that the definitions are different. And also a, a company's status for tax purposes can change between different tax periods. Uh, why is it important for tax law purposes? Well, the rules are different in some areas, depending on whether you are a public or a private company. So public companies typically have less stringent or simplified rules. And for private companies, there's various special um, anti-avoidance provisions, if you like, that can apply, such as excessive payments made by private companies to associates, maybe disallowed a deduction under Section 109 of the 1936 Act. Um, as we will discuss later, certain payments or loans made by private companies to their shareholders may be deemed to be a dividend under Division 7A of the 1936 Act. Uh, there's differences in the operation of the continuity of ownership test. Again, we'll discuss this test later, but basically it determines whether a company can utilise its carry forward tax losses. Um, it, the continuity of ownership test is a strict test for private companies. Um, whereas there are more um, concessional rules, if you like, that apply to public companies or other widely held companies. And also the benchmark franking rules, um, which again we will discuss later, um, differ depending on whether you are a public company or a private company. So we really need to get that distinction right. Um, in terms of the tax law definition of a public uh, company, uh, that is in Section 103A of the 1936 Act, and it's really looking at listed companies, so companies that were listed on a stock exchange as at the end of the year, or non-profit companies, or a wholly owned subsidiary of either a listed company or a non-profit company. And a private company for tax law purposes is simply defined as a company that is not a public company. There are some additional rules that relate to closely held listed entities. So if you are listed on a stock exchange, but if less than 20 people hold shares representing more than 75% of paid up capital and voting power or dividends, then you are deemed to be closely held and then you might be treated as a private company for tax purposes, even though you are listed. There are special rules here that relate to related parties that who may be um, bundled together and deemed as one shareholder. And also we have the, the commissioner's discretion here um, to treat a particular company as a public or a private company and that is enabled under the legislation. So let's have a look at our company tax rates. Well, for years in Australia, companies were only subject to a single tax rate of 30%, but relatively recently that has changed into a, a system where we have two separate tax rates. Um, and if you remember back to our module one webinar, um, you will recognize that the company tax rate are uh, company tax rates are proportionate taxes. So the rate of a tax does not increase or decrease as taxable income increases. Um, so the default rate for large companies is 30%, but if you qualify as what is known as a base rate entity, then you only have to pay tax at the rate of 27.5% for the 2019 tax year. Um, we say for the 2019 tax year because this rate is expected to be reduced even further over the next few years. 
so how do we qualify for this lower uh, tax rate? Um, the main test is that our aggregated turnover must be less than $50 million. That's the threshold for 2019. In previous years, it was a little bit less than that. What is our aggregated turnover? Well, we're really looking at ordinary income. So we are excluding statutory income, such as net capital gains. And we're not just including the ordinary income of our company. We also have to include any connected entities and any affiliates. So that's why it's called aggregated turnover. So the, the main test is uh, satisfying that aggregated turnover threshold of 50 million, but there is an additional test. And in order to be a base rate entity, um, no more than 80% of the company's assessable income must be base rate entity passive income. Now, really, that is income that is not active income, income in carrying on a business. So it would include things like dividends, where you hold less than 10% of the underlying company, um, interest, rent, and net capital gains. If most of your income or over 80% of your income comes from those more passive activities, then you cannot satisfy the definition of a base rate entity and you'll be subject to tax at the full rate of 30%. So let's have a look at our pre-webinar activity. Uh, Panda Network PTY Limited is an Australian resident company and records the following transactions in its financial reports. We've got $70,000 of fully frank dividends were received and recorded as revenue. The company paying the dividends pays tax at 30%. $80,000 was expense for the provision of annual and long service leave for employees. And there was a $25,000 bad debt, tra bad trade debt write off um, that was expensed in the accounts. The debt arose two years ago before the company was taken over and the business changed. So you were asked what adjustments are required in respect of the above three transactions to determine taxable income. I hope you've had a chance to work through this by yourself. Um, let's have a look at each of those transactions in turn. So first of all, we received $70,000 of fully frank dividends from a company that's paying tax at the 30% rate. So in order to recognize that in our tax return, we're not just including the $70,000 dividend received. We also have to gross up that amount for the franking credits attached to that dividend. And we do that by multiplying $70,000 times by the corporate tax rate over one minus the corporate tax rate. So effectively 70,000 times by 30% over 70%. Um, and that gives us um, a gross up of $30,000 on that dividend. So both the $70,000 um, amount received and the $30,000 in attached franking credits will be included in assessable income of the company. However, the company will then be entitled to a franking credit tax offset of $30,000. And that is subject to the holding period rule and the amount of tax payable by the company. And we'll discuss that a little bit later. So the next transaction here is $80,000 was expensed for the provision of annual and long service leave. And you might remember from previous tax studies that provisions are not deductible for tax purposes. Generally, we have to have the final expense um, in order for an amount to be deductible. So this provision here of $80,000, which was expensed in the account, has to be added back to the profit for accounting purposes in order to work out taxable income. The final transaction there is the 25,000 bad uh, trade debt write-off. Now, the issue here is that we've got a breach in the continuity of ownership test and the same business test here. And both of these tests must be applied to both uh, tax losses, capital, sorry, to all tax losses, capital losses, and also bad debts. So because we've got a breach of the continuity of ownership test, the company was taken over, and the same business test because the business was changed, we cannot actually get a deduction for that 25,000 um, bad trade debt. So that needs to be added back because it was expensed in the accounts in order to work out our taxable income. So hopefully you um, got all those um, transactions um, correctly categorized. Um, and so we will move on. So how do we calculate our income tax liability um, for our company? Well, it's in the same way as for 
all other share all other taxpayers basically we have our income taxes calculated as our taxable income multiplied by our relevant tax rate either 30 percent or 27.5 percent for companies and then once you've worked out that um, tax then you can take off any relevant tax offsets so that might be the franking credit tax offset or it might be something like the foreign income tax offset where you've received amounts that have been subject to foreign withholding tax. In calculating our taxable income, we are doing what we always do. We look at our assessable income and we take off any deductions that are allowable for tax purposes. So let's break things up with a quiz. ABC Limited is a resident private company with a turnover of $55 million. It had net trading income from the sale of goods and services of 400,000, including entertainment expenses of 6,000 and a provision for doubtful debts of 3,000. It also received a dividend from a resident public company of 50,000, which was 80% franked. And the company paying the dividends pays tax at the 30% tax rate. So the question asks, what is the taxable income for ABC Limited? So there's a, a few calculations that you have to make there. So I would recommend that you pause the video here, um, see if you can work out the final taxable income and then press play and we'll go through the solution. OK, so looking at the solution. The answer is that last figure, 476,143. How did we get there? Well, first of all, we look at our net profit before tax for accounting purposes, and that will constitute the $400,000 trading income plus the $50,000 dividend. So we've got $450,000 profit before tax for accounting purposes. And then we have to look to see if there are any adjustments necessary for tax purposes. So in this case, we have to add back some non-deductible items. We've got the entertainment expenses of $6,000. Hopefully you'll remember from previous tax studies that entertainment expenses are generally not deductible for tax purposes. We have to add back our provisions because remember, as we said previously, provisions are generally not deductible. So that's another add back of $3,000, taking us to $459,000. And then we also have to add assessable income that's not included in the net profit before tax um, for accounting purposes. So that will be the franking credit. And here we've got a $50,000 dividend, 80% franked. So we, we calculate that franking credit by multiplying 50,000 by 30 over 70 because the company paying the dividends uh, pays tax at a rate of 30%. And then we multiply by the 80% um, franking percentage to get our final answer there of um, 17,143. So, the, uh, so that, that gross up on the dividend is included in our taxable income. And the final taxable income figure comes to that last figure, 476,143. I hope you managed to calculate that figure. Um, and if not, if you hopefully you understand where you went wrong. So let's, so we've got this taxable income and now, how do we calculate the tax payable? And this is what this next quiz, quiz two, is all about. What is the tax payable for ABC Limited? So again, please pause the video, uh, see if you can work out the tax payable yourself, and then press play, and we'll go through the answer. So the answer here is that first uh, figure, $125,700. How did we get there? Well, we know that ABC Limited has a turnover of $55, $55 million. Uh, that is above the threshold for base rate entities. So it doesn't qualify as a base rate entity. And so we have to apply tax at a 30% rate. So based on our taxable income of 476,143, gross tax payable will be 142,843. But that's not the end of the story, because remember, we received dividends which had attached franking credits. So we can get a franking credit tax offset. And that equals to the uh, that's equal to the amount of the gross up we originally included in our assessable income of 17,143, leading us to a net tax payable of 125,700. Now you will see in a lot of these questions that people often forget this franking credit tax offset. Um, so if you get an exam question um, and you, you're grossing up um, for frank dividends, then please do remember that offset reduces your final tax payable. 
So just a summary in of how do we come to the income tax liability of a company? Well, we start out with their accounting net profit or loss. Um, we then add or subtract differences between accounting treatment and tax treatment. So that might be we might have different rates of depreciation for accounting and for tax purposes. And that will impact um, our calculations when we sell assets. We might have entertainment, which will be expensed in the accounts, but needs to be added back for tax purposes. And similarly, for provisions, we need to add those back because we're not able to claim a deduction. Once we get to our taxable income, which is assessable income, less allowable deductions, we apply our tax at the correct rate, depending on whether it is a base rate entity or not. And then we come to our gross tax payable. And, and at that point, we can take off any relevant tax offsets, including that um, franking credit tax offset and, any, and also any PAYG installments or tax withheld. In terms of what we um, submit to the um, ATO, um, this is what a company uh, tax return looks like. There's a couple of slides there that you can have a look at if you like. Um, but now we're going to move on to company losses. So what happens if instead of getting taxable income at the end of a particular year, you get a tax loss? Um, so this would be the case where deductions are greater than assessable income and net exempt income. So where you've got a tax loss, obviously you've got no tax payable. In working out that tax loss, you do have to be aware that certain deductions cannot create or increase a tax loss. These don't come up very often, but you need to be aware of them. And also, if you've got a situation where you've got excess franking credits, so say you come to a tax payable of 100, but you have franking credit tax offsets of 120, that excess franking credit tax offset is not refundable to the company but can be converted into a loss. And the way that this is converted into a loss is basically you get that, that $20 excess and you divide it by the company's tax rate. So either 30% or 27.5%. So we, uh, we're talking about losses here. And once you calculate your loss, that loss can be carried forward subject to certain tests known as the continuity of ownership test and the same business test. This quiz looks at the continuity of ownership test. So ABC Limited has the following share register records. Um, it's got three shareholders, A, B and C. In year one, only A and B held shares. And in year two, A, B and C held shares. So C, sometime in the intervening period, acquired 200 of the shares. Does ABC pass, a, pass the continuity of ownership test, otherwise known as the COT, for year two in relation to losses incurred in year one? The answer is a simple yes or no answer. Again, please pause the video if you want to give this a go yourself. Otherwise, I will go through the answer. So the answer here is no. Unfortunately, ABC PGY Limited doesn't pass the COT. So if it wants to carry forward any losses it made in year one, it will need to satisfy the same business test. And we'll discuss that shortly. But why doesn't it satisfy the COT? Well, initially in year one, uh, the year in which the loss was made, there were 200 shares on issue to A and B. And they have remained in their ownership. But... After the loss was made, an additional 200 shares have been issued to shareholder C, so that now only 50% of shares are in the same ownership as they were at the beginning of the period, so at the beginning of the loss year. So we've got a change, an effective change in ownership here. Um, the continuity of ownership test requires continuity of um, ownership um, of greater than 50%. So because we've only got 50% continuity of ownership here, only 200 of the 400 shares have remained in the same hand, then the cot is breached. And unfortunately, this company will have to rely on the same business test if it wants to utilize those losses in the future. So these loss recruitment rules, they don't just apply for tax losses. They also apply to bad debts, as we saw in our pre-webinar activity and also capital losses. And as we've said, in order to carry forward these amounts and potentially deduct them in the future, we need to pass either the continuity of ownership test or the same business test. 
So the continuity of ownership test set out in the 1997 Act requires that the same person have more than 50% control of the owner of the company. And there we're looking at rights to dividends, rights to distributions, sorry, rights to dividends, rights to voting and rights to capital distribution. There is a, a, a provision that says exactly the same shares must be held throughout the period. So um, that is called the same share, same person test. But if the only reason why the continuity of ownership test is because of this, uh, sorry, if the only reason why the continuity of ownership test is breached is because of that particular technicality that the same shares need to be held, then there is a rule that may save you, known as the savings provision. And that may mean that um, the continuity of ownership test can be passed after all. Um, in terms of tax or capital losses, the period that you are looking at is from the start of the loss year to the end of the year of recruitment, to the end of the year in which you want to utilise that carried forward tax loss. Um, if you're looking at a deduction for bad debts, the continuity of ownership test must be satisfied from the day the debt was incurred to the end of the year in which you want to claim a deduction for that bad debt. Um, so that's the period that we have to maintain more than 50% of the same owners. In terms of widely held companies, so listed companies and companies with a very wide range of shareholders, there are simplified continuity of ownership test provisions because it would be very difficult to work out who ultimately owned all the shares in that in those circumstances. So the simplified part basically applies to only require the ownership to be tested at certain points in time rather than throughout the period. And also, you don't have to trace through certain holding entities to the ultimate individual shareholders. So if you fail the continuity of ownership test, well, all is not lost because we can still have reliance on the same business test. And again, that is set out in the 1997 Act. Um, the same business test requires that exactly the same business is carried on during the year you want to recoup the loss as was carried on immediately before the continuity of ownership test was satisfied. There are another couple of further provisions. No accessible income from any new business or transaction can be derived. And you can't get around the rules by changing your business just before your continuity of ownership test was breached um, because there are anti-avoidance provisions in section 165 to 10 to prevent you from doing that. Um, so the same business test is um, more of a subjective test than the continuity of ownership test. Um, so, you, so in interpreting it, really, we're relying on case law and the ATO has also issued a tax ruling which helps us interpret it. But it's quite complicated because obviously if you've got a company in a tax loss position and it has a change in ownership, well, that new, that new management is probably going to want to make changes to the business to put the company in more of a profitable position. Um, so it can be very difficult to satisfy the same business test. And with that in mind, we actually have some changes to the legislation here uh, to introduce a more flexible, similar business test. Now, that's not going to be examined for you guys because that legislation wasn't in place at the time your study guide was created. So it's interesting to know about, but you don't have to worry about it for exam purposes. So we've got a bit of a timeline on this next slide to illustrate when we have to satisfy these tests. In terms of uh, continuity of ownership, that really has to be maintained from the start of the loss year to the end of the year that you want to utilise that loss. But if we have a failure of the continuity of ownership test, and that's right in the middle there of that slide, then all is not lost because we can try and satisfy the same business test. Importantly, when we are looking at the business, we are looking at what was carried on at the time just before the company failed the continuity of ownership test. So we're not looking at the business that the company carried on in the loss year. It's the business um, that was carried on just before ownership change. That's the business that has to be maintained in the year of recruitment.
Now, once you've satisfied your continuity of ownership test or your same business test, the company is able to deduct those losses against its other taxable income. But it doesn't have to. It has a choice. And you think, well, why wouldn't you want to deduct um, your taxes? Why would your uh, tax losses? Why wouldn't you want to reduce the amount of tax payable? Well, for companies, it may be that that company wants to frank a distribution to its shareholders. In order to frank a distribution, it needs to pay tax. So it may decide not to use um, carry forward tax losses in a particular year. If it does decide to use the losses, however, the oldest available losses must be utilised first. So it's a first in, first out basis. And also there is a restriction in that a company cannot deduct losses if that would create excess franking credits. Because remember, those excess franking credits um, can be converted into a current year loss that effectively um, freshens up or transforms um, old losses into new losses. And those new, um, you may find it easier for those new losses to satisfy either the same business test or the continuity of ownership test. Any unused losses can be carried forward to later years, but obviously we still need to be mindful of those two tests. We do have a short video on company losses. I would encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't already. So we've had a look at um, how we calculate the taxable income of a company, how we uh, calculate any tax loss and how that tax loss we utilise. The next segment of the webinar talks about specific incentives that are available to certain companies and their shareholders. And the most important one of these is the R&D tax incentive, which is a hugely valuable incentive for entities carrying on certain activities. So it's a tax offset um, of up to 43.5% of the relevant expenditure on R&D activities. So if your aggregated turnover is less than $20 million, you get the full 43.5% offset and it is refundable. If, you're, if you exceed that $20 million aggregated turnover threshold, then you get a lower um, uh, tax offset of 38.5% of your expenditure, and it is also non-refundable. So not quite as concessional, but still can create a massive um, tax offset and a massive reduction in the company's overall tax payable. However, the offset is reduced to the company tax rate, either 30% or 27.5%, where your notional deductions for your spend on these R&D activities is greater than $100 million. Not all entities are eligible for the R&D tax incentive. One thing to um, make sure you understand is that only companies can claim this incentive. So when we look at business structuring um, in a couple of modules time, um, we will discuss how if you've got an entity that is performing um, R&D activities, a business that's performing these activities, or you have a business who is developing significant intellectual property, then you really, really want that business to be operated through a company structure so that you can get access to these really important and valuable tax incentives. So in order to, in order to claim this incentive, you've got to be an Australian resident company or you've got to be a non-resident um, operating in Australia for a permanent establishment. You have to be carrying on R&D activities for basically experimental activities resulting in the development of new knowledge. And there's two types of R&D um, activities for the purposes of these provisions. There's core R&D activities and also supporting activities too. Uh, you will not get the uh, tax offset if you are not registered on an annual basis with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. So don't forget to lodge that registration. <laughs> In terms of calculation, um, you need to um, expend um, amounts greater than $20,000 in order to get the offset. And we're looking at expenditures such as, well, direct expenditure on um, research and development activities, decline in value of assets used for R&D activities, and also balancing adjustments on the sale of those assets. It doesn't include interest, um, expenditure that is not at risk, and the cost of any depreciating assets that you use. Now, important to note that if you are claiming this tax offset, you cannot also get a deduction under Section 8.1 for the expenditure because that would effectively double up 
um, your tax benefit there. So if you're claiming the R&DX tax incentive on expenditure, don't also claim that expenditure as a deduction. So the R&D um, tax offset is a really valuable offset for companies. Um, but what about for shareholders? Well, the early stage innovation companies offset or ESIC um, offset allows um, a tax offset for shareholders in certain companies that are carrying on innovative activities. So this has been relatively recently introduced into our tax legislation to encourage new investment in small, high growth companies. And it's a 20% non-refundable tax offset on your investment amount into those companies with a maximum offset of $200,000. Um, also, once if you invest in these companies and then you sell, subsequently sell your shares between one and 10 years after your investment, then you don't get any capital gain on the sale of those shares, which is great. Um, unfortunately, if you realize a capital loss, then that also is not recognized. So not so good if you are realizing your shares at a loss. In order to be eligible, the company must meet the early stage test. So it must have been incorporated within the last three years or the last six years if its expenditure over the previous three years is less than $1 million in total. The company must be unlisted with expenses less than $1 million and assessable income less than $200,000 in the previous tax year. And the company must meet uh, one of two innovation tests, either 100 point, uh, the 100 point test, where uh, the company is given points for particular activities or assets. So for example, it might get points for being eligible for the r &E tax incentive or points for ownership of certain patents. Um, if you don't want to satisfy the 100 point test, you can apply a principle based test, which basically looks at the underlying activities of the company and looks at whether they are involved in developing new or innovative products. In terms of um, getting that incentive, um, the purchase of the shares must be newly issued shares in the in the company. So you can't have transfers of existing shares. They would not be eligible for this tax offset. And also there are a range of exclusions requirements that are included in your study guide. But the main one being that uh, one particular investor cannot hold more than 30 percent of the shares in the company. So we're now going to move on to the second of our learning objectives, which is all about CGT concessions, rollovers and reliefs that are available to companies. Let's start out with a quiz. And this quiz covers the uh, CGT small business concessions, which are really valuable concessions that can make a very big difference to both companies and their shareholders when they dispose of a significant assets. So Margaret is an individual shareholder in company JKL. Margaret has a $100,000 capital gain eligible for the general CGT discount and the small business 50% active asset reduction. Margaret also has a capital loss of $20,000. What is Margaret's net capital gain for the year? Now, as always with these quizzes, please pause the video and try and give it a go yourself and then press play and we'll go through the answer. So the answer here um, for Margaret's capital net capital gain is $20,000. How did we get there? Well, first of all, we've got the 100,000 capital gain. Always the first step here is to reduce by any capital losses. And here Margaret has a capital loss of $20,000. So that gives us um, a reduced gain of 80,000. And then we can apply both the general CGT discount at 50% and the 50% small business active asset reduction which brings the net capital gain to $20,000. Another way of applying those two uh, concessions is you could divide the gain after the losses by four and you get to the same answer of $20,000. Now, the key point to remember here is that we always apply net cap uh, capital losses first. Um, we, we see a lot of um, candidates making that mistake and forgetting to apply those capital losses. Okay, so let's have a look at the small business CGT concessions in a little bit more detail. Um, there are requirements that need to be satisfied for all of the CGT concessions. And there, then there are specific requirements that only apply to certain of the concessions. And that's what we're going to have a look at now. 
So the overall requirements in order to have access to any of these concessions is that well, the first one is that a taxpayer must be a CGT small business entity or it must satisfy the maximum net asset value test. Now, important to note here that CGT small business entity, the definition of that, requires an aggregated turnover of less than $2 million. You'll note that there are other um, concessions within the Tax Act relating to small business entities, and they require a turnover of less than $10 million. So these CGT small business concessions only apply to certain small business entities with turnovers less than that $2 million threshold. In terms of the maximum net asset value test, if you don't satisfy the aggregated turnover test, you can rely on this one. It, requ it requires you to have um, CGT assets, less certain liabilities of $6 million or less. So that's the first requirement that must be satisfied in order to get access to these concessions. But it's not the only one. We also have to look at the types of assets being sold. So there must be a capital gain from a CGT event for a post-CGT asset, and the asset must satisfy the active asset test. What this basically means is that the asset must be used in business. It must be a business asset. And the, the asset has to have been used in business for half, up to half of the ownership test period. Having said that, if you've owned the asset for more than 15 years, it only has to be an active asset for 7.5 of the years. And there are special rules in relation to shares in companies. They can be active assets as long as at least 80% of the assets of the underlying company were used for business purposes. So those are the basic core requirements in order to access those small business CGT concessions. What are the concessions? Well, there's four in total and one or more may apply apart from the 15 year exemption, which only ever applies by itself. So the 15 year exemption basically, basically can exempt any capital gain on an asset that you have held for more than 15 years. It takes priority and cannot be used with any of the other small business CGT concessions. Alternatively, you've got the 50% active asset reduction, and we saw that in the quiz um, that we just looked at. Um, that reduces the capital gain by uh, a further 50% on top of any CGT discount that you may be, that the um, taxpayer may qualify for. We've got the retirement exemption, which can exempt um, capital gains up to a lifetime limit of half a million dollars. So you may apply this as an individual shareholder. You may apply um, this retirement exemption a number of times over your lifetime, provided your total um, amount shattered um, are no more than half a million dollars. And also, if you are selling a CGT asset but thinking of replacing it or improving one of your existing assets, then you might have access to the active asset rollover, which prevents any capital gain occurring on the sale. Now, in addition to the requirements we've already spoken about, there are special requirements in order for companies and trusts to have access to these concessions. And this slide really talks about a little bit of terminology that you will come across in your study guide, which will help you understand the special requirements. So here we've got Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, they own shares in company A, um, which has a wholly owned subsidiary company B. Now, in this situation, Mr. Smith, because he owns 40% of shares in company A, is a significant individual of company A. And also because he owns um, shares indirectly in company B, he's also a significant individual of company B. So what, what is required in order to be a significant individual? You must have direct or indirect ownership of at least 20%. So he's got 40% in company A and tracing through, he will have an effective indirect interest of 40% in company B. So he is a significant individual. And you will see when we come onto the requirements of each of the different concessions, um, you have to, often the company will have to meet um, significant individual requirements. Another, another piece of terminology that is used um, in the small business CGT concessions are C, is the CGT concession stakeholders. So here, both Mr. and Mrs. Smith are CGT concession stakeholders in company A and company B. Because um, there is 
um, a significant because Mr. Smith is a significant individual and Mrs. Smith is his wife. So just going back a step, uh, CGG concession stakeholders include all significant individuals and their spaces, provided the space owns some of the shares in the company. So Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith will qualify because Mr. Smith is a significant individual and Mrs. Smith is the space of a significant individual and owns some shares. That's her 2% shareholding. So because they satisfy these requirements, if Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith sell shares in company A, then they will have access to the small business CGT concessions provided other um, requirements are satisfied. Similarly, company A and company B, because it has a significant individual being Mr. Smith, and because it has CGT concessions shareholders, will be able to satisfy the requirements if they sell assets. So say company A sell shares in company B. So we've, got, we've spoken about the basic conditions that apply for all concessions, but our additional concessions um, sometimes apply. Um, uh, sorry. Additional co conditions sometimes apply for certain uh, concessions. So in respect to the 15-year exemption, the asset uh, must be held for 15 years and the individual who gets uh, who is selling the asset must retire or must be subject to some kind of permanent incapacity. So that's the requirement that must be met if an individual um, sells an asset held for 15 years. If a company wants to access uh, this 15-year exemption, then it must have had it must have a significant individual for 15 years. And we've just gone through what a significant individual means. It's all about that 20% share ownership. But importantly, um, it doesn't have to be the same significant individual across the whole 15-year period. As long as it's a, at all times during the 15-year period, there's a, a significant individual of the company exists. Um, additional requirement for companies is also that the significant individual must retire or be subject to some kind of permanent incapacity. If we're looking at our retirement exemption, if it's an individual trying to claim the retirement exemption, then either the funds used on the gain of this, uh, from the sale of the share um, must be used for their retirement, or if the uh, individual is under 55 years, um, the gain must be contributed to their superannuation fund. If a company wishes to claim under the retirement exemption, it must have a significant individual and there must be a payment to at least one uh, CGT concessions share stakeholders or their superannuation fund if those CGT concession stakeholders are under 55 years of age. So you can see how the, the, that terminology we discussed in the previous slide comes in um, in terms of working out whether a company can access these concessions. For the 50% uh, CGT um, uh, deduction, small business reduction, we don't have any further um, conditions that need to be satisfied. But for the rollover concession, we do. There must be replacement of the um, asset disposed of, or you must uh, um, improve an existing asset um, within one year prior or two years after the CGT um, asset being disposed of. We do have a short video on the small business CGT concessions that I would encourage you to look at if you haven't already done so. So we're moving on now to corporate restructure relief. So imagine you have um, perhaps a group of companies within um, Australia and you wish to reorganize your operations um, to change the structure. Um, normally that would crystallize some capital gains or capital losses. Um, but there are certain rollovers available within the tax legislation that allow you to restructure your business without CGT implications. Some of uh, uh, examples of those are demerger relief. So this is where a subsidiary company can be demerged from the head company and placed directly under the shareholders of the, of the um, head company. Script for script rollover, where you can uh, exchange shares in one company for shares in another and various um, other provisions that allow for the exchange of shares, exchange of rights or options, or exchange in shares 
in one company for shares in another company. Um, all those are set out in your study guide. I won't go through them in any detail here, but just be aware if there's some changes in a corporate structure, it's quite um, common that these reliefs may apply so that no capital gains tax liability is crystallized. So we're going to move on now to our next learning objective, apply the rules of the imputation regime to maintain a franking account. And as we said right at the start of the webinar, the purpose of this franking account is really to keep track of the tax that the company is paid so that then the credit for that tax paid can be passed on to the shareholders in the form of a franking credit tax offset. So let's have a look at how that operates. So the objective here is to prevent double taxation of shareholders. So obviously the company has already paid tax. And then when it distributes um, uh, amounts of profits to its um, shareholders, you don't want those profits to be taxed twice in the hands of the shareholders. What you effectively want is those shareholders just to pay top up tax of the difference between the company tax rate and their marginal individual rate. So the dividend imputation system achieves this by allowing the shareholders an offset for the company tax paid on the profits distributed. Um, so as we've seen in previous examples, the shareholders gross up the franc dividends with the amounts of franking credits allocated um, to those dividends, and that becomes assessable income. And then they're entitled at the end of their calculation to an offset for the amount of the franking credits allocated to that dividend. So frank distributions, mainly we're talking about normal dividends, although there are some other distributions that may be franked. And there is a maximum franking credit that can be attached to a particular distribution. Um, we see the calculation here at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's based on the company uh, on the relevant company's tax rate, so either 30% or 27.5%. And also um, in terms of any particular distribution, we've got this maximum franking credit, so it can only be franked up to a maximum of 100%. But you don't have to frank all distributions to 100%. You may decide to frank less or not frank at all. If you frank a distribution above the maximum franking percentage, so above 100%, then the impact for this is you will have a debit to your franking account. And we'll go through franking accounts later. But also your shareholder won't be able to take advantage of those excess franking credits. So they won't be able to um, claim an offset for those excess franking credits. Whenever a company makes a, a distribution, um, it is required to um, issue a distribution statement to its shareholders to let them know basically how many franking credits are attached to that distribution so that they can correctly calculate um, their taxable income. Um, the rules for issuing distribution statements differ depending on whether you whether you are dealing with a public or a private company. Public companies must issue these distribution statements on or before the date of the distribution, whereas private companies, I think, have up to four months after the end of the tax year to make those distribution statements. So a company can frank a distribution at, at, to any percentage up to 100%, but this is subject to one integrity rule called the benchmark rule. And the benchmark rule basically says that within a franking period, and we'll go through what that means in a minute, all, all distributions must be franked to the same extent. And the reason behind this rule is to prevent manipulation of franking policy. Um, so it's to prevent situations where you're trying to selectively stream some of your franking credits to certain shareholders over others. Now, the benchmark rule applies to most but not all companies. So it doesn't apply to listed public companies with only a single class of membership, basically because their, their um, options for manipula manipulation of franking credits are pretty limited anyway. And also the, the commissioner is permitted to allow a departure from the benchmark rule in certain quite extraordinary circumstances. 
So in applying a benchmark rule that all um, distributions within a franking period must be franked to the same extent, it is the first distribution within that period that sets the benchmark franking percentage. So if the first distribution is uh, franked to 80%, then all other distributions within that franking period must also be franked at 80%. If you underfrank a distribution, so say your first distribution is franked at 80%, but then your second distribution within the period is only franked at 70%, then there is a penalty debit to your franking account. Again, we'll talk about franking accounts a little bit later on. On the other hand, if you overfrank a distribution, so maybe um, following this example, your next distribution is at 90%, um, then there is a penalty tax equal to the franking excess. And as well as paying that tax, you don't get a credit in your franking account for the penalty tax paid. So in terms of calculating that penalty debit or the additional tax, um, there's your um, formula for working it out. And as we've said, um, the benchmark rule applies to a particular franking period. The franking period is the income year for private companies, but for public companies, it's split. So you've got the first six months is one franking period, and the second six months of the tax year is your second, is a separate second franking period. We do have a short video on the benchmark rule. Uh, please have a look at that if you haven't already. In addition to the benchmark rule, there are various other anti-streaming rules that are set out in your uh, study guide. We won't go through these in too much detail here, but you just have to be aware that they apply when a company is trying to um, sh effectively stream the benefit of franking credit tax offsets to certain shareholders at the expense of other shareholders. So you might have streaming using link distributions. So you might have a situation where non-residents receive unfranked dividends from a foreign subsidiary, while residents receive frank dividends directly from the Australian company. The reason why a company might decide to do this is because non-residents don't get access to the franking credit tax offset. So here we've got streaming, effective streaming of uh, franked dividends to Australia. Australian resident shareholders who can more effectively use those uh, attached frank, franking credits. The next type of anti-streaming rules apply to streaming using tax-exempt bonus shares. So this is a situation where some taxpayers would receive new shares instead of a frank distribution. So probably those shareholders that um, can't utilise those franking credit tax offsets for um, some particular reason. And also you've got streaming to shareholders who can most benefit from um, the franking credit tax offset. So in this situation, you might have a selective off-market buyback from resident shareholders treated as a frank dividends because it's the only the resident shareholders that can get the franking credit tax offset. Now, if any of these anti-streaming rules apply, the general effect is that there will be a franking debit imposed in their franking account to rectify the, the dodgy things that they have have done if you like. Another anti-streaming rule applies that and this one doesn't uh, result in a franking debit but it's just a disclosure requirement and you are required as a company to disclose to the commissioner where there have been significant variations in your benchmark franking percentage and significant for these purposes is where your franking percentage has changed by more than 20% per period. So here you are required to tell the commissioner that that has happened. And the, uh, the follow up there will probably be that the commissioner will look into your distributions to make sure that none of these other anti-streaming rules apply. So let's break things up with a quiz. Uh, JKL Limited has aggregated turnover of $60 million in the last tax year and has the following transactions in the current tax year. It pays income tax of $10,000 pays a fully franked dividend of $10,000 to shareholders. Um, what are the entries to JKL PTY Limited's franking account? Again, uh, please do pause the video and have a go at this question yourself, and then we'll go through the answer. <laughs> 
So the answer here is we have a credit to the franking account of $10,000 and a debit of $4,285. How did these franking credits and debits arise? Well, based on last year's turnover um, of $60 million, JKL Limited, PTY Limited is not a base rate entity, and so it pays tax at the 30% rate. In respect of our income tax payment of $10,000, that um, results in an immediate credit to um, the company's franking account of the amount of tax paid, so $10,000. When the company pays a fully franked dividend, because it's paying tax at the rate of 30%, then we work out our franking credits um, by multiplying the frank dividend of $10,000 by 30 over 70. And because it's fully franked, then we multiply by 100%, giving us a franking debit of 4285. So that franking debit is equal to the number of franking credits attached to that dividend uh, uh, that is paid to shareholders. So this moves us on to the idea of a franking account. And again, as I've um, discussed, uh, the franking account is the way in which a company keeps track of its tax payments so that it can pass the benefit on to, on, of those tax payments onto its shareholders in the form of frank distribution. Franking credits in the franking account arise upon payment of income tax and POYG installments, and also when that company receives frank distributions from another company. Franking debits, on the other hand, which reduce the balance in your franking account, arise on payment of frank distributions out to your shareholders, and also any refunds of income tax. So in this way, franking credits flow through the franking account and onto the shareholders when a frank distribution is paid, the shareholders that can then hopefully get access to the franking credit tax offset to reduce the tax that they end up paying on that frank distribution. So here we have an example of how this operates in practice. We've got a resident company. Um, it has taxable income of $100 and it pays tax on that at 30%. So it must not be a base rate entity, um, leading to a profit after tax of $70. Because it's paid tax at a uh, tax of $30, then it credits its uh, big account with that amount. So surplus of $70 is paid as a fully frank dividend. Here we've got to debit the franking account because we are making a payment to our shareholders. The amount debited is the um, franking credits attached to that dividend, which we calculate as 70 times by 30 over 70, which would equal a franking debit of $30. Now say that dividend is paid to another resident company shareholder, that uh, company shareholder recognizes the dividend income and also grosses it up for the $30 franking credit, giving taxable income of $100. But that's not the end of the story because we're talking about a corporate shareholder. That corporate shareholder will have its own franking account and it credits that franking account with the amount of credits attached to the dividend being $30. Assuming that this company also pays tax at the 30% rate, its gross tax payable is $30, but it also gets that franking credit tax offset of 30, which brings its net tax payable to nil. So the, uh, the corporate shareholder, because it pays tax at the same rate as the um, underlying company, then it doesn't have to pay any additional tax on uh, the dividends received from that company. So in terms of our movements in franking account, we've already talked about this quite a lot. Our credits to the franking account are in respect of the amount of any Australian tax paid when we receive fully frank distributions. And also this other point we haven't covered yet, if the company incurs a franking deficit tax liability, then the amount of that tax payable is also a credit in our franking account. And we'll come on to when a franking deficit tax liability arises um, very, very soon. Debits, as we've spoken about, uh, debit arises when we get an Australian income tax refund, when we pay a fully frank distribution, or also remember when we under frank a distribution under the benchmark rule, then we might get a penalty debit to our franking account, which reduces the balance of that account. <laughs> 
So we mentioned franking deficit tax in that previous slide. Franking deficit tax arises if at the end of the year, the company has an overall debit balance in its franking account. And the amount of franking deficit tax that the company has to pay is equal to the amount of that overall debit. The effect of the debit, the effect of the payment of franking deficit tax is you get a credit in your franking account, and that reduce that um, makes um, the overall um, franking account balance a zero. So it offsets that um, debit that we had previously at the end of the year. If you are liable for franking deficit tax as a company, then you must provide a franking return and also pay the um, franking deficit tax before the end of the following month after the year ends. So by the 31st of July, you have to um, um, lodge your franking return and pay that franking deficit tax liability. Now, the FDT liability isn't actually an additional payment of tax. It's more of a prepayment of tax. So you can use it as offset against future income tax or installment liabilities, subject to a restriction if you've gone a little bit crazy with franking distributions. So if you massively overfranked the distributions to your shareholders in the year, and that has resulted in that franking debit at the end of the year, then you have then the amount by which you can offset your franking deficit tax against your future tax liabilities is reduced by 30%. As we've said, if you are subject to franking deficit tax, you must lodge a franking account tax return. You must also lodge one of these returns if you've got a liability to pay over franking tax. So remember that arose if we over franked our uh, distributions in accordance with the benchmark rule, or if you've triggered this disclosure obligation for significant variations in franking uh, benchmark percentage. Um, and as we said, generally you have to lodge and pay by the end of uh, July. Um, but if the franking deficit has arisen as a result of a tax refund, then the uh, lodgement of payment is due 14 days after the refund of tax is received. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour on the franking account. Now let's have a quick look at the tax implications for shareholders receiving distributions. And we've already gone through this a number of times in our examples. So we'll whiz through this quite quickly. Um, when a, a, a shareholder receives a franc distribution, if you remember from our previous examples, what they have to do is they have to gross up the distribution to take into account any franking credits attached to that distribution. And then they may be able to have access to the franking credit tax offset, which reduces their overall tax payable. Now, the tax implications are a little bit different if the um, ultimate shareholder receives those dividends uh, through either a company, sorry, either a partnership or a trust. So these are indirect distributions. Um, and the way the rules work here is generally um, the distribution will be grossed up at either the trust or partnership level. And then that gross up amount will be distributed on to the partners or the beneficiaries. And then those partners and beneficiaries can look at um, applying the franking credit tax offset in their own personal tax return. So remember, whenever we have franked distributions, the recipient always includes the franking credit in accessible income. And then you may well be entitled, um, the recipient may well be entitled to a franking credit tax offset equal to the franking credits. Um, however, if you are a corporate um, uh, shareholder, then the amount of franking credit tax offset you can get is limited to your tax payable. You don't get a refund of the excess. But if you remember um, back from our earlier discussion, that excess franking offset can be converted into a tax loss. And just as a reminder, um, for um, corporate um, uh, uh, taxpayers, um, also remember that if you receive dividends or other amounts from overseas and they are subject to withholding tax, 
A similar process lies in that you've got to gross up the amount included in your assessable income to take into account that withholding tax paid, but then you get a foreign income tax offset um, to reduce your overall tax payable. Now, we've spoken about this franking credit tax offset, but it is not automatically available to all shareholders. Really, in order to qualify for this tax offset, you need to be a qualified person. There's a number of different ways in which you can be a qualified person. The main one is that you satisfy what we call the holding period rule, which effectively means that you have to hold those shares at risk for either 45 days for ordinary shares or 90 days for preference shares. There's a little bit of information on the holding period rule there that you can read uh, at your leisure. Another way that you can become a qualified person is if you are an individual shareholder, so a natural person, and all your um, franking credits for the year um, total five thousand dollars, total less than five thousand dollars. Then it doesn't matter whether you satisfy the holding period rule; you can still have access to those franking credit tax offsets. The final, way, uh, the final way you can qualify for franking credit tax offsets is if you're a particular type of taxpayer. Um, there are special rules relating to certain superannuation entities, but really what, what I wanted to bring out here was the situation in respect of, ben of uh, discretionary trusts. If you're the beneficiary of a discretionary trust, then you do not directly hold or have an interest in any of the trust assets. Um, so this, be, this becomes a problem when you're trying to satisfy the holding period rule. On the face of it, you don't have an interest in the underlying shares. So you can't hold those shares for the required 45 or 95, 90 day period. Um, so the only way in which um, a, a beneficiary of a discretionary trust can access the franking credit offset is if they either satisfy the small shareholder exemption, so they're trying to claim less than $5,000 of franking credit tax offset, or if that discretionary trust um, lodges an election to become a family trust. Uh, special rules apply to family trusts, which mean that you don't effectively have to satisfy the um, holding period rule in order to get franking credits flowing through that trust and onto your uh, beneficiaries. So that covers our treatment of shareholders um, in terms of normal distributions, but there are also other distributions that may be treated as a deemed dividend under the um, uh, Tax Act. And that's what this last um, learning objective covers, identify deemed dividends and their associated tax implications. So we'll start out with a quiz which illustrates some of the concepts here. FGH PTY Limited is a private company that has loaned a natural person shareholder $20,000 during the 2019 year. The loan is not secured by a mortgage over real property and the documented loan term is six years. The interest rate on the loan is 2.75% and the shareholder repaid the loan on 25th of July 2019. The company has not yet submitted its income tax return, which is due on the 28th of February 2020. So the quiz asks, would loan be a D dividend to the shareholder under Division 7A? Now, again, please pause the video and have a think about that yourself, and then we'll go through the answer. So let's have a quick look at the answer to this one. In this in this situation, the loan will not be a deemed dividend to the shareholder. Why not? Well, the loan details are documented and the loan term is less than the seven year maximum for unsecured loans. So Division 7A generally treats loans from a private company to a shareholder as deemed dividends. However, there are some exemptions. and One of the main exemptions is relating to what we call complying loans. So these are loans that meet maximum term and minimum interest rate requirements. Um, given that this loan is, um, the loan term is less than seven years, which is our maximum term um, requirement under these compliant loans, then that's good. It means that, well, we might be out of Division 7A. We might not have to worry about Division 7A. 
Having said that, looking at the interest rate, it's only 2.75%. The benchmark Division 7A interest rate, so the rate that must be uh, the minimum rate that must be applied in these complying loans, is 5.2%. So on the face of it, it looks like suddenly, well, we've met the term requirements, but we haven't met the interest rate requirements. So we're going to fall back into Division 7A, and this loan is going to be a deemed dividend. However, the loan has been repaid before the earlier of the submission and due date for the company's income tax return. Because the loan has been repaid within this period, we don't have to worry about Division 7A and we don't have a deemed dividend in the hands of the shareholder. So that's all good for, for that shareholder. Now, we do have a short video on the application of Division 7A loans. Please do have a look at that if you haven't already. Um, but effectively, Division 7A is a, an anti-avoidance measure that prevents um, private companies, and remember, it only applies to private companies, from distributing certain benefits to their um, shareholders without paying tax. So let's have a look at what type of benefits might be covered by Division 7A. We're looking at payments to shareholders, loans to shareholders, and the forgiveness of debts owed by those shareholders. So in terms of payments, that includes cash, but it also includes transfers of property. Uh, it can also include the private use of assets owned by the company. So say the company has um, maybe cars or boats or holiday homes. And the, the use of the, those assets um, is provided to shareholders of the private company, then that can be caught within the Division 7A and treated as a deemed dividend. In terms of the amount of the deemed dividend, it's the market value of the cash or the property or the private use reduced by any consideration given by the individual shareholders. In terms of loans, well, we can have certain circumstances where loans arise. It may just be a direct loan, as we saw in our previous quiz, if a private company loans an amount to shareholders and that amount isn't um, paid, repaid by the time that company lodges its tax return or the due date for that tax return, then that will generally be a deemed dividend under Division 7A, subject to those rules for complying loans where if the interest rate is sufficient and the term isn't too long, then you might get be excluded from these provisions. Um, another circumstance in which um, a deemed dividend can arise is where there's an, what we call an unpaid present entitlement. We spoke about these a little bit in the trust module, um, but basically this is a situation where a trust has a corporate beneficiary and the uh, trustee of the trust resolves to distribute um, a certain amount of trust income to that corporate beneficiary, but doesn't actually pay that amount out. So it's an unpaid present entitlement. That can fall within the definition of a loan for Division 7A purposes and can result in a deemed dividend arising. And finally, debt forgiveness, if the shareholder owes the company some, the private company some money and the private company effectively um, says that you're, you're never going to have to repay that, that money, don't worry about it, then again, Division 7A can be triggered. An important concept within Division 7A is that you the amount of deemed dividend is limited to the distributable service of the private company. And the calculation of distributable surplus is um, set out on this slide. We've got a little bit more detail in the next slide. So you're looking at your net assets of the private company. You add on Division 7A amounts, which are effectively payments and forgiven debts, which have been treated as deemed dividends in the current year. You take out any non-commercial loans. These are loans that have previously been treated as deemed dividends under Division 7A. You also take up off your paid up share value, so your share capital per the account, and also you reduce the amount by any repayments of loans that were previously treated as deemed dividends under Division 7A. So we have a little bit of a decision tree about Division 7A, whether you fall within it or not. So the first box on the left hand side there, did the company pay an amount or loan an amount or forgive a debt um, to a shareholder? If yes, we're looking at whether the, any of the exclusions apply. And as I've mentioned, one of the main exclusions is for complying loans, so loans that meet certain term and interest rate requirements. 
they are out of Division 7A, provided that you make minimum repayments on those loans. Another important exclusion is the company to company exclusion. So if you've got a private company making a loan to a corporate shareholder, those loans are not included within Division 7A. Um, if none of the exclusions apply, then we, really what we're looking at, at is the company's distributable surplus. Um, if, the, um, if the deemed dividend is greater than the company's distributable surplus, then the amount of the deemed dividend will be reduced um, to the, that amount. So we've gone through Division 7A and seen how certain benefits provided by um, companies can be um, treated as dividends in the hands of the shareholders. But those aren't the only deemed dividends that can arise. Deemed dividends can also arise when we've got a share buyback situation. So where you've got a company that buys back some of its own shares from its shareholders. Now, if that is done on market, so during normal trading on a stock exchange, then no amount of the buyback price is treated as a deemed dividend. So we don't have to worry about dividends. We just have to look at for the individual shareholder, they're looking at their normal capital gains rules on the disposal of that share. However, if we have an off-market share buyback, then a certain amount of that buyback um, consideration may be treated as a deemed dividend in the hands of the shareholder. So the amount that is a, a dividend, and it's a frankable dividend in this case, is equal to the purchase price, so the amount the company paid for the buyback of its share, minus any amounts um, debited to the company's share capital account. Um, that the dividend, as we said, is generally frankable, but if the amount, if the price at which the company buys back its shares is greater than the market value of those shares, then that excess amount is not frankable. So obviously we've got a situation here where our um, sh shareholder has uh, disposed of some of their shares. There will be capital gains tax implications, but in working out our capital gain or loss, our consideration for CGT purposes is reduced by any amount deemed to be a dividend because otherwise you would have double tax. So, so this is best illustrated by an example. We've got Flyer Limited, a listed resident company, conducts an off-market share buyback for $80 per share. The company debits its share capital account by $20 per share and funds the remaining purchase from profits. The market value of the shares as determined by commissioner under a class ruling is $75 per share. The company's benchmark for the franking period is 100%. The standard company tax rate of 30% applies. For each share purchase, what is the dividend required for ranking credit and the deemed consideration for disposal for CGT purposes? So let's have a look at that in turn. So we've got um, what element of the buyback price is a deemed dividend in the hands of the shareholder? Well, we have the buyback price $80 per share. The amount debited to the share capital account is $20 per share. So the amount of the deemed dividend is the difference between those two amounts of $60. So $60 will be a deemed dividend. Can we frank that deemed dividend? Well, let's have a look at that. The frankable amount of the dividend is so much as does not exceed the market value. So only the, that part of the purchase price that does not exceed market value is a, distribu is a frankable distribution. So in this case, the buyback price of $80 exceeds the market value by $5 per share because remember the commissioner determined that the market value was $75 per share. So consequently, the dividend of $60 that we just calculated contains a $5 unfrankable amount. Um, so frankable amount is $55. We know that the company's benchmark franking percentage is 100%. And so the relevant franking credit is $55, your frankable amount, multiplied by 30 over 70, because the company pays tax at the 30% tax rate, times by your 100% uh, benchmark franking percentage, which gives us a franking credit attached to each share of $23.57.
So the individual shareholders have received a deemed dividend, which is partially franked, but they've also um, sold their um, underlying um, uh, share. So we need to calculate any CGT implications. And in doing so, the deemed consideration for the disposal of the shares is reduced um, by the dividend amount. So we sold these shares, in this case, for $80, um, the individual shareholder will reduce that $80 by the amount of the dividend of $60. And so their consideration in working out um, any capital gain or loss will be $20. We do have a short video on share buybacks. Please have a look at that if you haven't already. Now we're getting to the end of the webinar now. Our final um, deemed dividend that can arise for tax purposes it occurs when a company is wound up and there are certain distributions by liquidators. To the extent that those distributions are funded by out of profits of the company, then those distributions can be a deemed dividend for tax purposes. And in working out whether those dividends have been paid out of profits, there are certain extensions. So it includes all assessable income, and there's also an adjustment for net capital gains. So we exclude um, the benefit of any indexation or capital losses. So we've got this adjusted amount of profits. If the dividends, if distributions by liquidators are made out of this adjusted profits figure, then they will be deemed dividend in the hands of the shareholders. And these deemed dividends are frankable, and so they will be accessible to shareholders um, along with any franking credits attached. So module four is a big module, as we said right at the start, it's um, worth 13% of the overall course. You really need to understand the principles here. We've got a summary that companies are taxpayers and must submit an income tax return and pay tax in their own right. Um, in terms of company losses, um, capital losses and bad debts, we've got these special provisions, the continuity of ownership tests and the same business tests, one of which must be satisfied. Um, you've got a range of incentives and concessions and reliefs that apply to um, specifically to companies such as the R&D tax incentive, such as those uh, special tax offsets that apply to um, ESIC shares. You've got the CGT small business concessions that can apply to companies in certain circumstances and also to their shareholders. And you've got various restructure reliefs that can prevent CGT arising where you've got a restructure of a corporate group. Uh, resident companies and also any other shareholders in receipt of franking um, frank dividends gross up their assessable income. Um, by the amount of the franking credit, and they are also generally um, entitled to a franking credit tax offset. But remember, there are those rules like the franking, uh, like the holding period rule that must be satisfied. Uh, resident companies are franking entities and must maintain a franking account. So you remember the franking account really keeps a record of how much tax the company has paid so that it can pass on the benefit of that tax um, in the form of franking credits to its um, shareholders. And private companies may be deemed to have paid unfranked dividends where payment loans and debt forgiveness is provided to shareholders or their associates. So that's one instance in which deemed dividends can arise that applies under Division 7A. But there are also other deemed dividends that arise, say, on an off-market share buyback and also certain liquidators' distributions. So we've gone through Module 4. Um, where are we at and what is next? Uh, next week, we will be dealing with module five, which deals, which is looking at when you've got groups of companies and certain other entities, how can they be uh, taxed um, under the tax consolidation regime? So before the next webinar, please make sure you prepare, you watch all of our short um, videos, uh, read module five, and also attempt the module five practice quiz and the pre-webinar activity. As always, we end on our mastery slide with 40% of the way through. We've covered some really meaty topics, but these topics will help you understand the modules that are to come. So please make sure that, you're, that you've read the modules, that you understand them. If you have any queries, please post a query on the My Online Learning um, Ask the Expert forum. But at this stage, I will say goodbye and I will see you for the next webinar. Thanks for listening.